Merrick Garland finally addresses the raid on Donald Trump's private residence in Mar-a-Lago in Florida. And it's sort of lacking, not a whole lot there. He speaks for about four minutes and he takes zero questions, very much like his boss, just sort of uh, ends it, makes a run for the door, except in this case, Merrick Garland paused for a very brief moment and reminded the reporters that he's not answering questions. So he said, no questions, and I'm not answering questions again, just so that they're clear. And we have a lot to unpack here because, of course, he is the United States Attorney General. He's also somebody who's probably a little bit angry that he's not on the Supreme Court. He was a Supreme Court nominee who failed after sort of Trump won, and the whole thing changed, and he's got, you know, the consolation prize over there in the Biden administration. And so the decision, as we learned today, to invade Trump's private residence, to break precedent, to sort of, uh, you know, sort of open up an entirely new can of worms, Merrick Garland was the guy who ultimately approved the decision, which I want to start with, okay? We're going to revisit the United States government organizational chart because a lot of people, largely on the left, many Democrats, fail to recognize the massive conflict of interest that exists in this saga. And so let's break this down. Now, the White House knows that this is even a huge problem, a major conflict of interest, because Kelly O'Donnell is somebody on Twitter. She's a reporter from some entity. And here's what she said. She said, as we await Attorney General Merrick Garland, who is coming out today, and his statement, a senior White House official tells me the Biden White House was not informed this was happening. Okay, so can you just, what, for a minute, what? So you're telling me that the White House had no idea that the Attorney General was going to come out and speak about indicting or, or about subpoenaing and raiding and potentially indicting, right? Potential, like nobody knew what he was going to say at this time. He could have announced an indictment. He could have announced all sorts of things, right? Nobody knew. He came out and said basically nothing. But you're telling me the White House didn't know that? Like he could have come out and indicted him or and nobody would have had any idea at the White House? All right, so here's the rest of this ridiculous statement. It is... We have had no notice that he was giving remarks and no briefing on the content of them. So they're just totally clueless over there, which is par for the course. I mean, you know, it's sort of what we've all expected. Joe Biden is shaking hands with, you know, who knows what. And it's a weird situation. So they have no idea this is happening. And, you know, obviously, I think that's ridiculous. I don't buy that for a, a minute. And uh, I actually said that on Twitter. What did I say? Did I say something about it? I, I forget what I said. But the point is, I said that it's fake separation, right? The idea that they are actually unaware of what's happening is ridiculous. And why do I say that? It's because if they don't know what they're doing, then it's it, basically Merrick Garland is running his own Justice Department. Okay, If Joe Biden doesn't know what Merrick Garland is doing, then uh, I, I guess is it is it Merrick Garland's government? Because this is exactly why. As you can see, the U.S. government has more or less an org chart. And they actually have this published on a government website. Let me show you where this one is. If you look up here, you can see in my browser, right, it says usgovernmentmanual.gov, right? It's a .gov website. So you can uh, go there and you know, explore around if you'd like and just type in U.S. government org chart. And as we learn in social studies or grade school or wherever, we have three branches of government, right? The, the uh, losers in Congress are over in the legislative branch. Then we have the Supreme Court over here. And, you know, that's got a sort of a, a, a branch, a co-equal branch. And then right here in the middle, what do we have? We've got the executive branch and look who's right on top. The president. Dun, 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 dun. And guess what? Underneath the president, not underneath anybody else, is, as you can see right here, we can just follow the red pen. Da, 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 da. It's like a Disney movie. We got to go this way. Up, oh, nope, made a wrong turn. Go back down. It's like a maze on a game. Oh, we're going passing the Department of State. We're about to pass the Department of Labor. We just keep on going. Ma, 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 ma. Da, da, da. It's the Department of Justice. There it is. Look, it goes right from the executive branch right to the Department of Justice. So what does that mean? I guess it means that the White House, uh, the president, is the executive of the Department of Justice, okay, from this government's own website. Now, I, I, you know, I, I thought this is what they taught us, you know, in, in social studies, not, you know, not just law school, but in civics class, but they can't figure this out. So the White House comes and they say, apparently, they have no idea what the heck is going on. There is no conversation between these two entities right? Nothing. 
Joe Biden is not in charge of, I guess, anything. Doesn't so, so that begs the question, does he have any idea what's going on anywhere else? I mean, Pete Buttigieg was on maternity leave for like two months. Did he know? Like, does Joe Biden have people clocking in and out? Does he have somebody like punching cards? You have to check in on an app or something. Or are these guys just running around doing whatever they want? Because the White House has no idea. So it's sort of he's negligent and out of control if they didn't know anything about it. And if he did know about it, right, it's a massive conflict of interest, which is why they're faking that they don't know anything about it because they know it looks really bad, right? This looks terrible because Joe Biden has said outright that Donald Trump is essentially his political enemy, his political nemesis. And to have him now being prosecuted by the Department of Justice, so you just follow the chain over here, right? Donald Trump is this guy, Donald Trump right here. Merrick Garland is the person who authorized, as we're gonna learn, the, the warrant to go seize Donald Trump's property and guess who's in charge of Merrick Garland? Yeah, that's right. Joe Biden, the president of the United States. So they can't get around that, right? It is a direct conflict of interest just by virtue of the fact that it's happening. So uh, you're going to see a lot of that garbage. And they're all also going to come out, as we talked about on a previous video, they're going to shift the burden. They're going to say Donald Trump has to prove his innocence, not the Justice Department has to explain this massive conflict of interest, right? They've got no obligation to explain any of that. It's up to Donald Trump to prove his innocence as they're going to stand behind uh, you know, a podium in front of the Justice Department symbol back there and they say, uh, we stand for justice. All right, so let's actually get to Merrick Garland so we can listen to uh, how he explains this. Now, the one highlight, of course, is the point right here that we will ultimately listen to in context. But here is the five second bit from the attorney general about who authorized the search warrant. I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. All right, so there you go. So very clear, clear as day. I personally approved the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. So like a million questions about that, right? Who'd you talk to? Who briefed you on this? What memos did you see? What case law is involved in your analysis, right? What happened? Who was part of the deliberations? And of course, the most important question, what did Joe Biden say about this, right? Did you tell him about this? How could you make a decision so big without telling Joe Biden? That would be like negligent, right? Because it would mean that he's just acting like on his own, not even remotely connected to any administerial uh, administrative or oversight at all. All right, so let's go through and listen to Merrick Garland. This is the full four minutes uh, for, from him today. And I'm going to try, I'm, I'm going to presume that you listened to it already because, you know, it's probably, it's four minutes. You probably already, you know, heard it when you were brushing your teeth. But it's, it's very bland. I'm going to try to minimize my pausing, but let's see how I can hold out. Good afternoon. Since I became attorney general, I have made clear that the Department of Justice will speak through its court filings and its work. Just now, the Justice Department has filed a motion in the Southern District of Florida to unseal a search warrant and property receipt relating to a court-approved search that the FBI conducted earlier this week. We're going to read that in a minute. That search was of premises located in Florida belonging to the former president. The department did not make any public statements on the day of the search. The former president publicly confirmed the search that evening. Trump's as fault. is his right. Trump's fault. They're blaming Copies him. of both the warrant and the FBI property receipt were provided on the day of the search to the former president's counsel, who was on site during the search. All right. And so there's a clear disagreement about that, right? We've heard from several people on Trump's team saying, no, we didn't get a warrant or they showed us the warrant and there's some disagreements about that. He comes out and says, no, we gave him the warrant, right? And you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, room for disagreements about what that means and how that all works. And so both sides are covering their butts. Somebody's obviously being dishonest or uh, interpreting what that means differently, but it's, it's a very important point of contention, I guess, but you know, ultimately, well, let's let him finish before I start going off. The search warrant was authorized by a federal court upon the required finding of probable cause. For, uh, the property receipt is a document that federal law requires law enforcement agents 
to leave with the property owner. Great. The department filed the motion to make public the warrant and receipt in light of the former president's public confirmation of the search, the surrounding circumstances, and the substantial public interest in this matter. Faithful adherence to the rule of law is the bedrock principle. All right, so we'll just pause it for there for a minute. So the, the point of that entire first minute and a half is to say Donald Trump came out and he's the person who actually made this all publicly available, okay? So what, what's, what's trying to happen, we, we looked at the org chart. They're trying to say that these are two separate and distinct entities, right? You know, the White House is sort of independent of the DOJ. The DOJ is investigating this and prosecuting this as though they were a special counsel, right? As though that they're sort of not in a conflict, as though there is no potential bias here, or let's say uh, direct bias, obvious bias, because the president, current president, has said that they are you know, very, very angry at Donald Trump. They want to remove him as, as a threat to America, is what they've said. So Merrick Garland is blaming Trump for having to come out and file this motion to unseal, more or less. He's saying, Donald Trump, he's the one who made this public. We were doing this all under the darkness of night because we didn't want you to know anything about it, you know, but he made it public. And since he did, well, now we're filing a motion to unseal so that you can see all of this America. And right, he's sort of shifting all of this over, you know, back onto Trump. If he wants to talk about it, he's free to talk about it. But we, as the DOJ, are, are holding to the regular status quo, right? This is where he's being very sneaky about this saying we have an obligation to maintain the ethical obligations or the requirements of the DOJ. We can't talk about this because of precedent and because this is how we do things at the DOJ. The problem is there is other precedent at the DOJ that says you don't do these types of raids on former presidents or for, and political people. There's history here, right? Hillary Clinton didn't get raided. Obama didn't get raided. And Trump talks about that later today. But they are breaking precedent and they're trying to treat this as like it's a Hunter Biden investigation. It's not right. Hunter Biden doesn't is not running for president. He doesn't have 83 plus million people who are very, very interested in supporting him. So they're trying to sort of take this unprecedented action and wrap it around in historical precedent. And you say you can't do that. I mean, you, you, you can you can say that you can. You're, you're doing it evidently. But if you expect us all to sit here and go, oh, that's a good explanation. I guess we don't deserve an explanation because uh, uh, of historical precedent. Well, show me. Mr. Merrick Garland, where somebody else raided a former president in the United States history. Show me that precedent so I can see how those defense attorneys responded. And maybe I'll, I'll have some good education about that. Maybe I'm being unreasonable. I don't know. But I can't look back in history and say, oh, well, the last time uh, some lunatic dictator in our country invaded a former president's house, this is how it unfolded. Don't have any histor history of that. I, I mean, unless you want to go back to like the Civil War, okay? <laughs> then I, then I, guess, I guess that's the closest analog we have. All right, so let's listen to the rest of this guy. ...principle of the Justice Department and of our democracy. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. Hillary, Under my Hunter. watch, that is precisely what the Justice Department is doing. All Americans are entitled to the even-handed application of the law to due process of the law, and to the presumption of innocence. We're going to Much talk of about our that. work is by necessity conducted out of the public eye. We do that to protect the constitutional rights of all Americans and to protect the integrity of our investigations. Federal law, longstanding department rules, and our ethical obligations prevent me from providing further details as to the basis of the search at this time, it's such a chicken maneuver. You know, it's we have to do something that nobody's ever seen before. That is it's entirely unprecedented. I'm going to say that it's going to be the word du jour of the day. But it is something that, you know, he thinks that you can apply that old standard to something like this. And maybe they'll get away with it. I don't know. Maybe enough Americans will do. Well, whatever. I guess it's a formal process and due process. But I doubt it. Here he is. There are, however, certain points I want you to know. All right, tell us, Merrick. First, I personally approved the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. Yeah, and so you have to presume that Joe Biden knows about it, right? That Joe Biden was in the loop. They had a conversation about the political ramifications of this, about the uh, national security implications of this. 
that there was a whole set of debates and conversations about this. And so I, I would love to know what went down there right now. Or, or Joe Biden doesn't know, and he's a negligent president who has no idea what the attorney general or the U.S. government is doing. Second, the department does not take such a decision lightly. Where possible, it is standard practice to seek less intrusive means as an alternative to a search and to narrowly scope any search that is undertaken. Third, let me address recent unfounded attacks on the professionalism of the FBI and Justice Department agents and prosecutors. I think he's talking about me, maybe even some of you. I will not stand by silently when their integrity is unfairly attacked. Oh, no. The men and women of the FBI and the Justice Department are dedicated, patriotic public servants. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Every day, yeah. they protect the American people yeah. from violent crime, terrorism, and other <laughs> threats to their safety while safeguarding our civil rights. Okay. They do so at great personal sacrifice and risk to themselves. I am honored to work alongside them. This is all I can say. All right, so that's, okay, hilarious, right? Yeah, I see the chat. Everybody's laughing in the chat. It's hysterical, right? Every, hey, we fight every day to create fake kidnapping plots to maybe catch some uh, young guys who were uh, hanging out with undercover FBI agents. I don't know, you know, whatever they're doing over there. <laughs> uh, we work every day at the FBI to meet with Democratic lawyers and talk about uh, fake dossiers of our political enemies. We work every day to not investigate allegations against American Olympians. Yeah, amazing, yeah. And they're building Lego sets after January 6th. So just outstanding, amazing. So uh, not much out of that, right, comes out. And you gotta come out if you're the CEO role or the leader. I, okay, whatever, Merrick. But he is uh, now gonna just say, I can't talk about this anymore. Hey, right now, more information will be made available in the appropriate way and at the appropriate time. Thank you. Okay, no questions, walk away. away. FBI agents. Um, thank you all for your questions. But as I said, this is all I can say at this time. Okay, so that is uh, Merrick Garland delivering four minutes of nothing. No real answers other than he approved it. And uh, that means, I guess, talk to the president, Joe Biden, about it. And he was very uh, commendable to the FBI agents who have uh, given tirelessly for American safety and the creation of fake uh, kidnapping plots. And so for just a quick moment, I wanted to remind you that there is this website. It's a Wikipedia page. But it's a list of FBI controversies. If you just want to take a quick look at it, I mean, uh, there's a lot of them here. So, you know, all the way back, domestic surveillance. Uh, most of these are about the FBI sort of being engaged in some serious uh, misdeeds, right? Some serious, let's say, uh, less than honorable affairs, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton email investigation. So, like, for example, it sort of feels like kind of similar to this. Let's see. Uh, on July 5th, F FBI Director James Comey announced the Bureau recommendation to file no criminal charges against Hillary Clinton's email controversy. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, during an unusual 15 minute press conference, Comey called Secretary Clinton and her top aides extremely careless instead of grossly negligent, right? Which would have been criminal. Extremely careless though is like not grossly negligent. It's like extremely careless and not grossly negligent because one's criminal and one's not. So the corrupt FBI just changed some of the memo and said, uh, no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. And so corruption all the way through and through. We've got Inspector General problems, Loretta Lynch. We've got Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, lawmakers, many others. Remember Peter Strzok over here, James Comey being dismissed, uh, all sorts of misdeeds. We talked about the FBI being, you know, just uh, awful. Andy McCabe being dismissed, the list goes on and on, right? So if you want to read through it, uh, somebody should actually send this over to Merrick Garland and maybe he'll uh, find some some usefulness in uh, recognizing as the attorney general, as the head of the Department of Justice, that the FBI could use a little attending to to uh, improve their performance over there. But a big question that we also had was about 
why is Merrick Garland bringing all of this forward or, or where, where is this leading? And yesterday we had some great questions from, I believe, three girlies, shout out to the youngest girly and others who were sort of asking about this warrant process and why a lot of it seemed to be under the cover of darkness and why, you know, warrant executed was not unsealed and all of this stuff. And, you know, I made the point to say, you know, I'm not, I don't know, right? A lot of this has, has literally never happened. So nobody really knows uh, what the, their sort of strategy is or what they're trying to, what law they are trying to bring this under, right? How they're trying to justify these actions. Well, there is something called the Espionage Act. And if you take a look at it uh, here, you can see there's a long history of various people being prosecuted under the Espionage Act. It is the Espionage Act of 1917. It punishes acts of interference with foreign relations uh, and the foreign commerce with the United States. And so, you know, this has actually been used before and there's a lot of history here. And uh, if I scroll down, I think you can see some names of people who have been prosecuted under this. And, you know, th th this could be one theory where they, you know, they bring charges under Trump. And if you recall, I believe, uh, gosh, this article is like way bigger than I thought I had queued up. Here you go. Yeah. Edward Snowden, right? He was charged under the Espionage Act. And we also had Julian Assange was charged under the Espionage Act. Uh, eight uh, prosecutions in both Trump and Obama administrations. Chelsea Manning was prosecuted. You see this one. And uh, just a whole slew of people. So maybe this is what the charges are being brought under, you know, I don't know. But we do see there's a little bit of activity that popped up over in the federal court docket. So this is over on the U.S. federal uh, back end. It's called Pacer. And the most recent entries are here at the bottom. So let's scroll up just a little bit and work our way down. You can see a lot of entries came out today, this morning on uh, 8 11. Yeah, this is the current date. And here I'm listening to John McGarvey over on Locals. He says, Rob, you're slowly changing my preconceived feelings about defense attorneys. Well, thank you, John. You know, we're on the side of justice, man. We're on the side of the Constitution, the presumption of innocence, due process, equal protection. You know, big government bureaucrats are prosecutors. I mean, really. And so, uh, you know, we, I believe in law and order and I believe in good prosecutions and all of that. I have to live in the same society as everybody else, but the government has to prove their case. And that's not, not always easy for them to do. So thank you, John. We see here that look at all this activity starting this morning on 810, 811, I'm sorry. The clerk noticed we have a motion to intervene to seek access for the court records. That was an erroneous entry, so we can skip over that one. We have a, mo a, a paperless order granting the motion to intervene. So the New York Times now is joining the case, right? And remember, yesterday we read through uh, up here, there was a request by Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch actually wanted the warrant unsealed. They, they said we're, you know, we are a journalist and we are a nonprofit and we want to expose corruption in the government, therefore unseal the warrant. And the New York Times also filed something as well. So that has been granted or the, the motion to intervene has been granted, but we still are waiting on the unsealing of the warrant. We had this morning again on 8-11, a, a paperless order coming out from the magistrate judge. Judge Reinhardt, he says, to avoid the need for individualized orders on any future motions, it's ordered the government shall file an omnibus response to all motions to unseal on or before August 15th at 5 p.m. All right, so basically this judge is saying that he, he doesn't want everybody to sort of a call response format. So everybody files their motion to unseal. Like in other words, New York Times, we want to unseal government response. Hey, New York Times, here's our response to you. And then Judicial Watch files a motion to unseal. And then they say, here's our response to that, right? So they just said, look, everybody file your motions to unseal. The government just file this omnibus motion, a big fat motion, and respond to all of them at the same time. And that is going to be due on the 15th. And so if we queue that date up, when is that? That is the, oh, that's Monday. All right, cool. So that's Monday. And then we have, so we've got a deadline on Monday. In other words, we'll have new motions on Monday. So we're not gonna see the warrant unsealed prior to that day at least, right? Because the government at least has that deadline to respond. We also see that somebody is filing a motion to appear pro hoc vice, which means we've got lawyers coming in from out of state. Okay, this is somebody over from Judicial Watch. So saying, all right, you know, we filed our motion. Judge, I'm not generally admitted to this jurisdiction, but can you let me come in as a lawyer? And the judge is very likely to do that. 
Same thing here, uh, Judicial Watch, motion to appear pro hoc vice. Attorney update in the case. So, yes, okay. So the attorney from Judicial Watch got added to the docket. We've got some restricted entries. We talked about those yesterday. Those are just sort of placeholders. We can't see what they are, but the court can see what they are. 811, this is the motion to unseal. Now, this is what came out from the DOJ today. You can see this here. It says, a motion to unseal docket entry 17 regarding order five on motion to unseal the document by the USA attorney Juan Gonzalez added to the USA and their case. So let's take a look at this order. This is what Merrick Garland was just talking about that we just listened to. And here it is. Okay. Filed United States motion to unseal the warrant and the limited warrant materials filed on 811, five pages long says here, hello, judge. On August 8th, that was on Monday, the Department of Justice executed a search warrant issued by this court upon a finding of probable cause to go invade the former president's home with FBI agents. We're very interested in Melania's dresses. At the time the warrant was initially executed, the department provided notice directly to former President Trump's counsel at the time. The department did not make any public statements about the search and the search apparently attracted little to no public attention as it was taking place. But later that same day, former President Trump issued a public statement acknowledging the execution of the warrant. In the days since, the search warrant and related materials have been the subject of <gasps> significant interest and attention from news media and other government entities, other entities in general. In these circumstances involving a search of the residence of a former president, the government hereby requests that the court unseal the notice of filing and its attachment, the docket entry on 17, which we can't see right now, absent objection from President Trump. So they want him to go and say, I object to this, which I think he probably should, right? And why, why would he agree to unsealing it? Uh, I would make them, right? Here's what's gonna happen here, right? There's gonna be a lot of debate about this, should Trump unseal it? Should Trump not unseal it? I want to be very cognizant of one thing. He has no obligation to defend himself against anything, right? This presumption of innocence thing is pretty damn important. And if we start saying Trump has to show this up or he should have to reveal something or he should have to make a statement about this, that, or the other, that is conceding ground. He doesn't have to say a dang thing at all. What they're doing is unprecedented. They need to justify their actions in a way that is supportable that justifies this breach of protocol but to come out and say donald trump should just you know show him everything or you should you know i understand that but at the same time you know as a defense attorney you, that's not something you know, there, there's not a lot of bravado to this stuff you just you, you don't you don't help them a bit and don't let them take any of that ground from you and say you should be explaining yourself away judges try to do this all the time and different you know and prosecutors try to do this all the time you don't have to say anything. You can sit there and play Sudoku on your phone during a trial and be acquitted. The government has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. But you're going to see a lot of this and you're starting to hear some of this now. They're going to say Donald Trump can unseal it or whatever. The search warrant signed and approved by the court on August 5th, including attachments A and B, would be something that would be unsealed. The redacted property receipt listing items seized pursuant to the search filed with the court on August 11th. They want that unsealed. Consistent with standard practice of this court, the search warrant and attachments were each filed under seal prior to the search. Property receipt was filed under seal today. Former President Trump, through counsel, was provided copies of these documents on August 8th as part of the execution of the search. They say they weren't. Or they're saying that they got something that wasn't what they wanted. Who knows where this shakes out, but they're saying they gave it to him. In these circumstances, argues the government, the court should unseal the search warrant, including attachments A and B and the property receipt, absent objection from the president. Why? A lot of this language mirrors some of the language we talked about yesterday when the New York Times and uh, Judicial Watch wanted this unsealed. They say the press and the public enjoy a qualified right of access to criminal and judicial proceedings and the judicial records filed therein, citing 11th Circuit cases, the unsealing of the materials pursuant to common law requires the balancing of the competing interest. What's the benefit of sealing it, keeping it sealed? What's the benefit of unsealing it? And what are the harms of both? How do they relate to one another? And how does it shake out? We have a, a quote from another case from the 11th Circuit. And they say, look, judge, 
Given the intense public interest presented in and by a search of a former president, they acknowledge, the government believes these factors favor the unsealing of the search warrant, its attachments A and B, and a property receipt if Trump doesn't object. So is, you know, are they going to come out and if Trump up does object, they're going to come out and say, oh, he's got something to hide, doesn't he? Oh, he's just a little criminal because if he were not a criminal, well, he would just show us his cards. Don't fall for that crap. Do not fall for that crap at all. You know, it's just like somebody coming to your house and saying, uh, let me rummage around through your house. Are you a criminal? Uh, I mean, do you have like, do you have do you have illegal stuff in your house? No, no, I don't. Well, then let me come in and just look around. Well, just show us. Show us that you don't have anything illegal. And I was making this same point about stinky Eric Swalwell. You know, he's out there saying Donald Trump should show his cards. I want to see Eric Swalwell's Tinder account. I want to know how many Chinese spies he's swiping on. Okay? It's, uh, it's a lot. I'm sure of it. So, you know, and, and I, I beg him to disprove me on this. Show his Tinder account. Although the government writes the government, initially asked, and this court agreed to file the warrant and attachments under seal, releasing those documents at this time would not impair the court functions, including the government's ability to execute the warrant, given that the warrant has already been executed. So we needed it to be sealed, but now we don't. Furthermore, on the day that the search was executed, Trump issued a public statement that provided the first public confirmation that the search had occurred. Subsequently, the former president's representatives have given additional statements to the press concerning the search and public characterizations of the material sought. For example, Christina Bob, one of Trump's lawyers, a lawyer and aide to Mr. Trump, who said she received a copy of the search warrant, told one interviewer the agents were looking for presidential records or possibly classified material. And the government says, as such, the occurrence of the search and the indications of the subject matter involved are already public. They cite another case, Chicago Tribune and others. So the government says on page four, this matter plainly concerns public officials or concerns, and it involves a law enforcement action taken at, they acknowledge the 45th president of the United States. What? What? It's just amazing. You know, like, honestly, you're reading, you're reading history on right here. The search warrant authorized for the property, which, you know, this is the residence of the 45th president of the United States. It's, it's amazing. The public's clear, you know, this is all going to end up in case law, right? The law, law school students are going to be reading this for generations uh, if America survives. So maybe only a couple of years. The public's clear and powerful interest in understanding what occurred under these circumstances weighs heavily in favor of unsealing. That said, former president should have the opportunity to respond and lodge objections, including with regards to any legitimate privacy interests and any other injury if these materials are made public. To that end, the government will furnish the counsel for the president with a copy of this motion. Conclusion, signed off on by Juan Antonio Gonzalez over at the DOJ, served on uh, all the appropriate parties. And so you can see that, right? Here is their proposed order. So this is where they send this off to the judge and they say, listen, judge and uh, clerk, you don't have to type any of this stuff up. Let me just hear it. Let me give you an example here. Don't think too hard when you put this together. Here's what I propose the judge just sign off on. Says, I I'm recommending that you say, having, apply uh, having us applied for this order, we ask you to order that the motion to unseal the limited warrant materials is granted. So those docket entries become public. And number two, docket entry number 17 and its attachments are hereby unsealed, signed off on. They want the judge to say, Bruce Reinhardt, you know, whatever here, and sign off on this puppy. And we'll see what the judge does. And that is Merrick Garland. Now he's got, you know, a lot of uh, people asking a lot of questions. His press conference to America was four minutes long. Really didn't answer a whole lot for us really left us wanting to know more. And as soon as we do find out more, as soon as Merrick Garland gives us a hint of what they are intending to do, we'll be sure to continue to cover it. And I appreciate you following our work.